Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for each person here. Lord, we just pray that uh, we would put our eyes to you right now, that you would open our open our eyes and our ears to see and to hear the things of, of, uh, of your spirit, Lord, and your love for us, the, the good things you want for us. And Lord, we lift up our brother Steve and, and wife Cookie, Lord, and we just pray that you'd give them strength right now. Lord, we pray, if it's your will, Lord, that you'd bring them back to the big island and uh, let them know that they're loved and we care for them. Um, and Lord, we just pray for the Korean church and their outreach, that you would touch lives, and even now, Lord, that you would touch our lives. We ask that now, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, guys, this morning we're going to start our look at the uh, uh, epistle of uh, John, called 1 John. It's near the end of your Bible. There's three little teeny letters. I like, they're short and sweet. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and each one gets progressively shorter. So, um, but we're going to start with 1st John chapter 1 this morning, as we're going to delve into these things now this is john the apostle writing the same guy who wrote the gospel of john in the in the beginning of your new testament there's matthew mark luke and then john and this is the same writer but john is writing this letter a bit later than the gospel that he wrote and this one addresses some of the well there were some false teachings that had come out about god in the time when he was uh you know walking the earth and uh, um, when when John was there, he said, "Look, I, I'm." He's going to explain. He was an eyewitness of Jesus's visit to this earth, and he's going to explain it in the most short, succinct things that that just su- such an encouragement. It says here. Let me read with me verse one. It says, "What was, what was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life." And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Now, w- he says, what we have seen and heard, this is, this is what we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, these things we write, he says, so that our joy may be made, what? Complete or whole. That we would have fullness of joy. Now, this is, this a little letters, five chapters long. In my Bible, just a couple pages. The Bible chapters are the best, aren't they? They're not like long, long chapters. It's just a couple pages. But this one is power packed. Because this one, John is saying, I want to tell you guys about eternal life. The word of life. The word of life, he says, that was manifest. What does it mean manifested? Anyone use that in a sentence this week? It was manifested, right? Uh, yeah, use that all the time, right? Christian lingo sometimes, you got to like adapt. So help me out. If the kids were asking you, what does manifested mean? What would you, a, a more easier way to say it? What? Made to be, what? Revealed, shown, you know, made, made uh, so you could see. It was a, it was a revealing Manifesting is to, to unveil or to show something from the Greek, the word that is used here. It's the, it's the taking away of the mystery of it being there and rather pulling away the curtain. What, like you could say, oh yes, God is there, but we can't quite see him. He's behind a curtain. If we were going to see him manifested, we'd just pull the curtain back. And, and, and that, you know, you can picture a stage, you know, when the actors are behind the curtain and they open the curtain up and there's the whole cast and you see them. And they're, they're now revealed, manifested. This is what John says happened to him. The word of life, eternal life, somebody pulled the curtain back and who gets to see it? John says we did. He says we, not only did we see, this is really neat. Uh, now, for those of you, if you ever wondered about your faith, like, is being a Christian really legit? I mean, how do we know we're not following some weird fable or fairy tale? Or, or did this really happen? Did, did Jesus really come to this earth? Did he really? You know, these are things. I'm really grateful for guys like John. 
You know, and, and how about doubting Thomas in the Bible? You know, it says, he said, I'm not going to believe that the, the other apostles were saying, we saw Jesus risen from the dead. And he's going, I don't believe you. You can tell how close they were. You know, like, I don't believe you. I, I, not until I put my finger in the holes in his They said, it's him. He's got the holes in his hands. He's got the hole in his side, you know, holes in his feet. And doubting Thomas goes, look, I'm a tactile learner. No, he didn't say that, but he, he, he was, right? He was one of those people that, you know, some of us learn by, by sight. We're visual learners. Some are auditory learners. Some are the people that have to get their hands into the project and work on it, you know, touch. And, you know, you, you could tell them all day long about how to rebuild the motor, but until you get them in there in the shop and start wrenching and tearing it apart and letting them do it, they're never going to learn how the motor works. Diagrams, all the visuals you want won't work. They got to put their hands on it, take it apart, see how it fits together, put it back together, and then they go, now I get it. I thank God for Thomas in the Bible, the one they called Doubting Thomas, because he said, I ain't believing you guys. Not until I, what? Not, he didn't say not until I see Jesus. Not until I, what? Touch him. I got to put my finger in the hole in his hand, and I, got, I have to see this him for my own self. Now, some people fault Thomas for this, but I'm glad he's in this story. Because, uh, honestly, I think I would have been, I don't know about you, but I would like to have at least, if, it, if they said, yeah, it's really him risen from the dead. You know, it would be one thing to say you saw him, you'd be, but then I, I'm kind of skeptical. I'd be like, was it a ghost or was it, you know, how do I know it was really him? Thomas is like me. He'd be like, let me touch you first. Let me stick my... They, said, they told him, he's got the holes in it. Now, this is interesting because the Bible declares Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he arose flesh and what? Bone. Not flesh and blood because it says his blood he shed on the cross for whose sin? For us. So he arose flesh and bone. This is why when John starts to talk about these things about we had manifested to us this word of life, this guy who had eternal life, had power over death, even with his blood gone. I mean, first thing Jesus does when Thomas is in the room eight days later with the disciples, he shows up and Jesus this time, he says, right, right to Thomas, Thomas, be thou no longer unbelieving, but be what? Believing. And what's he do? Here, go ahead, stick your finger in there. Here. And I could just see the Lord going, here, stick your hand in the hole in my side. Now, I don't know. It doesn't say if Thomas did it, but but would you? Like, hey, really? Oh, look, there's a hole right in your, like, you got plunged with that spear of that soldier. And let me just see what, I mean, you're alive and, ooh, gross. Well, wow. I mean, if you're, like, into, you know, anatomy and physiology, you might be going, this is really cool. Look at you know, but, but Thomas, Jesus did not, did Jesus, like, you know, what's the right word, talk him down, like, like, condemn him, shame on you for not believing, no, no. Jesus just comes along and says, here, let me help your faith, you don't have to be unbelieving, be believing, here, go ahead, put your, go ahead, stick your arm in there, go ahead, but, but you you want to see my feet? Go ahead. Now, can you imagine? I mean, Thomas, it says in the Bible, he went from doubting to what? To believing. And I'm glad he was in this story. I'm glad that he, you know, he, at least one of the guys was willing to say, I got a touch to see. But here, I want to point this out. He's not the only one that got to touch the risen Lord. I, I say this because... Well, you guys know the account. Who was the first one who clung to Jesus when he was appeared in the garden and there was one of the, you guys know that she's saying it, Mary. By the way, if you didn't notice, a woman was the first one to see Christ risen from the dead. For you guys are going, yeah, I know why. Because if you want to get the news out, don't tell the guys. Get the girls. You know, Jesus was smart. He appeared to Mary, and he said, Mary, and all he had to do was say her name. And she was like, oh, Rabboni, that's you, great teacher. She grabs him, won't let him go. She's like, hey, let go. I haven't ascended to my father yet. 
But go tell the disciples, I'm alive, and I'll meet them. And she went and told them. And it says that she appeared to them like she was what? A little woo-hoo, right? They, they thought she was crazy. Jesus, by the way, scolded those guys for not believing her. She was, she was telling the truth. Christ was risen. But this news, John was also one of the guys there. And I like, when he writes First John, he says, what was from the beginning, remember in John's Gospel, John 1, he said, in the beginning was... The Word, the Word was with God, and the Word what? Was God. So, by the way, some of the cults change that, that translation. They say the Word was a God, not was God. It was a God, like there's many gods, and Jesus just was one of them. No. Jesus was very clear when he was on the earth. He said, they, they said, show us the Father. And he said, have I been with you so long a time? If you've seen me, he said, you what? You've seen my Father. I and the Father, he, he declared to the, to the Pharisees, are what? One. As soon as he did that, by the way, the Pharisees knew what he was saying. They weren't saying, I am a God, one of the many. He was saying, I am what? I am God. And when he did that, they picked up stones to, to stone Jesus to death because it says, you blaspheme. How can you, being a man, claim to be God? But this is what John is trying to say. God, you know, the, how many of you have heard this question in your experience of life? If God is really real, why doesn't he come down here and show himself? Anyone heard that before or, or thought it? Me? Like if God is really real, is a real God, a living creator of all things, what's he afraid to show himself? He did. You're right. That's what Jesus came. And by the way, if you, if you don't know Greek, it's okay. But in John 1, when John is right, he's writing in Greek. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The word that is used in Greek for word is logos. Logos is a, a Greek word. We actually translate logos into English as logo. A logo, um, like the Nike swoop, you know, on the, on the side of the, of, of the tennis shoes, that little swoop. You don't even have to see the word Nike anymore on a, on a pair of shoes, do you? Because they have put that swoop so many times on their, on their products that that little representation, that little logo lets you know, I uh, identify that's from that company. Well, when John wrote the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, and he said, in the beginning was the Logos. What was he saying? In the beginning was the exact representation, the thing that when we see it, we uh, instantly identify that's the, the mark or the logo of who? Of God. And Jesus came when they said, show us the Father. It'll suffice. He said, look, if you've seen me, here's the Logos. Here's God's logo. I came. That's a great question. That's why I'm here. I came so that you would know the Father. And that was Christ's mission, to help us to, to be introduced to the everlasting life that comes from the Father. Well, John says, I'm writing this, this little letter to you. And by the way, when I went to Bible school, I remember we were taught this letter had seven different reasons. You know, like that John includes in this short little letter. He'll say, and I write this because of this. I write to you. Well, verse five, if you'll, or verse four, it says, uh, these things we write, he says, so that your, our joy might be made what? Full or complete. I'm writing so our joy, now our joy, who's he talking to? Us, the, read, the reader, and apparently he was not by himself when he was writing. He's saying, because he didn't say what I have seen, what I have heard, what I have touched, what I saw manifested. He said what we have seen. What we have, this by the way helps my faith. It wasn't just one guy that saw Jesus risen from the dead. Do you know that? 
You know, there was a man named Josh McDowell. He was a professor, I believe, at UCLA, one, considered one of the top ten geniuses in the world when I was back in college days. And he gave his master's and doctorate students their thesis work to work on. And, and he would tell them, look, I am sick of these Jesus people. They're everywhere. There was, a, there was a great revival happening in the country at that time. And he's like, I gotta shut up these Christians. They're driving me crazy. Jesus this, Jesus that. Everything is talking about God and how he loves us and wants us to have everlasting life. I gotta shut them down. All right, you master student, you want your doctorate, you gotta write a thesis on why the Bible is false. Prove, t- take mathematical approach, take a, take a uh, scientific approach, take Whatever approach and proofs, disprove, let's, let's break this thing down and tear it to shreds. And that's what he did. For the next few years, he made all of his students trying to get their doctorates to disprove some facet of the Bible. Pretty soon he had so many papers on his desk that he went, wait a minute. He, he, look, let's just prove this whole resurrection thing. Then we can shut the Christians up. If we can just prove that Jesus didn't rise, that would work, wouldn't it? Except what do we have to do in a court of law to establish a fact? We have to prove it by how many witnesses? Just one? No, we have to remove reasonable doubt. Two or more credible witnesses have to be brought forward. How many witnesses do we have of the resurrection? Hundreds. Hundreds. of, And this is what he's... His evidence, as the students began to research it, they found that you could take away the whole Bible... Don't look in here for the proof. Just look in secular writings all around the world, and you could produce enough evidence that proved that Christ rose from the dead that finally Josh McDowell said, I, this evidence demands a verdict. And he, by the way, he became a Christian. He finally just caved. He was like, he fought against it, fought against it, did all this. And, and if you want to read the book, it's a, like this big of a volume. All these doctorate, it's very heady reading, but, but it brings down all different things like mathematical probabilities and the statistical things that, that just for Christ to fulfill all these prophecies that were foretold. And by the way, for me, I'm a math geek. I thought it was cool because Jesus, like, just to be who he said he was, he either had to be the son of God or there's just no way a man could fulfill all the things that Jesus did. And it, to me, it helps my faith. I know that sounds geeky, but it really made me think, you know, I don't have to check my brain and turn it off just because I'm a Christian. If someone says to you, oh, just turn off your brain, you don't even, wait a minute. What, what was the first command? The one that, that, that when that lawyer tested Jesus, he said, um, what do I have to do to have everlasting life? And Jesus said, how does it read to you? And he quotes from Deuteronomy. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy what? Heart? And that's it, right? No. No. All thy heart, your mind, your soul, that that spirit part of you, and your strength. On all dimensions of your being, heart, mind, soul, and strength. And what I don't like is some Christian circles that say, just turn off your brain. Come for this nice emotional experience. Come for this one, well, you'll feel so great. Listen, the gospel will make you feel great. But you don't have to turn off your brain. You know, we have, the, we have these things. Josh McDowell, one of the evidence that was so, to me, like, obvious, I thought, well, he is not very, he's a genius and he didn't notice this. Did you know that in all the cultures of the world, our calendars are marked by an event? You can go globally, check this out, A.D., and B.C., remember? What, what was a B.C.? And by the way, when someone says to you, I don't know if Christ really came to this earth, play stupid. Just say, uh, what's B.C.? B- 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 before Crayolas? <laughs> before cookies? You know? And they'll go, wow, yeah, you sh- aren't you a Christian? That's so stupid. Before Christ. And you go, yeah, that's right. And the Bible actually says that in the last days that they will try to change the way that they keep time. And do you know that about a decade ago, over in Jerusalem, instead of saying A.D. and B.C., which was, you know, I've been to Israel five times. Thirty-five years ago, they said, this happened, you know, in uh, 500 B.C. Well, now today they're saying 500 B.C.E., before Common Era. (laughs) 
Yeah. And A.C.E., by the way, it's exact date of what you know as A.D. and B.C., but they've got, they, they want to erase the fact that Christ came. So it can't say Ani Domini, the Latin for A.D., Ani meaning year and Domini. Those of you who had to take Latin like I did in Catholic school, Domini is the dominant one, or we say the Lord, the year of the Lord. Well, they go, no, it's A.C.E., after Common Era. <whistles> Somebody's a real thinker. It's because they don't want to acknowledge the coming of the Messiah. But see, the Messiah did come. And John says, we saw him. We were, we were there. Our eyes looked at him. And notice this, I just have to point this out, just so you don't think Thomas is the only tactile learner in the group. Read verse 1 with me. What we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. We were there. Christ, indeed, this concerning, he says, the word of life. We actually saw it. We touched it. Now, that's what you want for a credible witness, by the way. You've got a, someone in a court of law testifying about, was he really here? I want a guy who was like, not just, I saw from a distance. He's like, no, I saw, I was this close, I touched concerning this. Where I, in fact, do you remember at the Last Supper, where was John seated? In the table, you know, remember? Because no, we don't have uh, any of the seating um, assignments at the table except for one fella in the gospel. Do you guys know that? This is for your Bible trivia, guys. Who was the one fella who had the closest seat to Jesus, so close it says that he leaned back on Jesus' breast during, the, during the, the Last Supper? Who was the guy sitting next to Jesus going, uh, I'm going to hang with you? John. John, now I don't know about you. Anyone here volunteer to be that close to Jesus? Like, would you like to, like, if you, it, you know, his last meal and you want to hang with him, who here would go and ask to be seated where John was? Scoot over, John, man, let me in. Dude, I don't care. And uh, this is not some gay, weird thing. He just knew how much he was loved. It says, because when John writes, he says, John, the beloved of the Lord, the one who is loved of the Lord. I'm the one who Jesus loved. <laughs> she says most. <laughs> yeah, they get in arguments all the time. Oh, are you the one? I don't know. He loved me more. No, me more. <laughs> no. If only we actually understood how much we're loved by the Lord. I mean, really, do you think it would help some folks that struggle with self-esteem? We have a young girl in, in, in our youth group, and she, she just feels like she's not loved by her own earthly father. And it makes her sad. It makes her do harmful things to herself. And, and I, I've sat with her. I've told her, look, it doesn't matter what your earthly father does. Our heavenly father loves with a love that is, well, it's unending. Never stops. And you can come to him. And the scripture says, because we have been given the spirit of God as an earnest deposit, we, in our spirits, cry out. As children of God, we cry out, Abba, Father. Who can tell me what Abba means in Hebrew? Daddy. Yeah, you go, Abba. You're, you ever hear a little Hebrew kid going, Abba, Abba? He's calling to Daddy, Daddy. Or she is, Daddy, Daddy, Abba, Abba. That's just the word for Dada. That's the Hebrew equivalent. Okay, You want to know what it really is, Dada, in English. It's Abba in Hebrew. But it, the Bible says we, once we come to faith in Christ, we are now adopted into God's family. And it, we're going to see, in, by the way, in John, 1 John chapter 3, that see how good, you want to peek ahead at verse 1 of, of chapter 3? See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called, what? The children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. The world didn't know him, but we do. And this is one of the cool things. John, he writes these things. He says, guys, I touched. 
with my hands, I, my eyes looked upon him. I, he, he didn't say we all leaned back on his chest there at the Last Supper, but he did. He said, but we write these things that our joy might be complete. Here's the first reason. Now, in Bible school, I, I started to say this. In Bible school, they told us there's seven reasons that John wrote this little letter. There were seven ways he's going to describe how do we know what we know is really to be known. I mean, this is a true philosophical dude. I mean, he's, he, well, he's, in, the, he's in the age of, if you're not familiar with the times when Jesus came to this earth, the Greek culture was very... Um, coming to the end of its superpower. It, it, in fact, Alexander the Great had ruled the entire world for a brief period as a world ruler. And when his kingdom, you know, he had young man, he, he went and got drunk. He had conquered everybody, and he just didn't know what to do, so he went drinking. And then it says he stumbled home in the, in the rain and got pneumonia and died. And his generals fought over who gets to take over, and, and uh, eventually Rome took the advantage of this, this weakness in the, Gre the, the, the Greek stronghold over the world, and they stomped in and, and took over. And that's when Jesus comes to this earth. But to tell you that the Greek philosophers and the Greek way of thinking and culture had not permeated the world would be foolish. You know, that so much of the understandings that... The way Paul describes some of the things in the New Testament, he uses the Greek philosopher's verbiage to explain things about the true and living God. He, he's just like, look, guys, these guys, this is how they, you know, there's all these guys thinking, um, well, the Greeks were polytheistic. They had Zeus and Hermes and right Aphrodite, all these different gods and goddesses. And, and he says, look, there's only one true living God. The one that concerning the one that gives everlasting life. That's the one I want to tell you about. And he even, Paul gave a great discourse there at Ephesus about how this is the true and living God and any other God that's made by human hands, anything we fashion out of wood or clay or stone, that's no God at all. He actually will see a great revival to where the artisans get really mad at Paul. They're like, this guy is ruining our business. Nobody's buying trinkets. Nobody's buying our little carvings and statues because they're all turning from these false gods to the true and living God. Praise the Lord. But do we have the same thing going on today? With people following false gods and, and things that are not God, things that men make? Listen, if a man could make it and form it on a potter's wheel and then call it a god, it is no god. It's a pot. Get real. I mean, I don't care how you carved it or shaped it or whatever. You're, if you're taking something from, you take a tree and you carve it into this little statue and call it God, it's not God. You took something from creation and you created something from it. And the Bible says, do not exchange the things of creation for the one who created it. Do not get duped into thinking, I'm going to worship the creation. No, man, I'm here to tell you, I worship the Creator. I love the whale show. I love that the Lord puts whales here on Sunday morning. It's, I mean, how many churches get to have whales pop up during the sermon? I know it's a little distracting, but it's fun. You know, it's God showing off. All creation testifies of whose handiwork? His. And you will never hear me say, I worship whales. I worship the Creator of the whale. I worship the creator of heaven and earth and all the things on the earth. And I'm not here to worship something a man takes from the earth that God created. And then he makes a little stone statue. says, there's my God. Let's worship. Fall down and walk. Blah. False God. That's what it is. Not here to worship that. I'm here to tell you about the true and living God. And this is what Paul, uh, uh, John is telling. Guys, we have witness concerning the word of life. We saw. It wasn't a stone. It wasn't a carving. It was the real deal. In the beginning was the word, the Logos. The word was with God. The Logos was with God. The Logos was God. And what does it say a little further in John chapter 1? And the word became what? Flesh. And we beheld him. 
full of grace and what? Truth. Jesus came and, <laughs> man, he answered the question that lots of people think and many verbalize. If God's really there, why doesn't he show himself? Jesus said, that's what I came to do. Now, if they don't know Hebrew, you can give them this little simple tutorial. Just the very name of Jesus in Hebrew. Jesus' name, by the way, in Hebrew is not Jesus. That's American English. What is Jesus' name in Hebrew? Do you guys know? If you went up to him in the days 2,000 years ago when Jesus was walking on the earth and you said, hey, what's your name? Because he had a name, Yahshua. We pronounce it Joshua, but it's really in Hebrew, Yahshua. Yah for uh, a, 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 a shortening or a contraction of Yahweh, the Lord. And Shua, Shua in Hebrew is, is salvation. So you go, what's your name? The Lord salvation. Wait a minute, this is a mystery. I don't think I can solve it. Are you sure? What's your name? Um, we, we'd say, God's salvation. That's tricky, huh? Uh, this is why I like a little bit of Hebrew. It's helpful. Because sometimes people are like, what was the big deal about Jesus? The big deal is he's God's salvation. You know, Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to what? To save it. That's why I'm here. I came to say, and John's saying, I'm going to write you this letter so our joy can be complete. You got to know about this guy that we saw, we touched with our hands. This is the guy who gives everlasting life. Is this a good thing to talk about? You know, we had a hungry world just perishing, not knowing about how to get everlasting life. And John says, I'm going to write you some reasons that, that well, they're going to, the, if, and by the way, if you, if you don't mind, as I go through this, I'll give you these. Uh, we, were, we were taught seven reasons, but to be honest, I found eight. We were also taught there are seven things that you can know that John reveals to us that are those kind of questions that people ask. How do you know that you know that? You ever heard those questions? The, by the way, and if someone asks those questions, I'm not one of the guys that goes, oh, I don't want to talk about questions like that. I say, John the Apostle talked about him. He gave the answers. And by the way, I found eight of those too. Not seven. They, I think seven was used in Bible school because seven is the, what they call the number of completion. You know, seven notes in the scale, lo, the whole notes on, a, on a white keys on your piano that you get to the eighth one, the octave. And then, or, or seven days in a week. A, a group of seven is considered God's perfect number. So in Bible school, they told us there's seven reasons he wrote this letter. There's seven ways we could know what we know. And that there's also seven false confessions that men make with their tongue. All in this one little five-chapter letter, a couple pages. Now, I'm not going to tell you them all today. But I'm going to tell you there's eight reasons that I found. There's eight ways we can know what we know. And a ninth optional, but I, I just, I'll, I'll throw that one out for later. It's a ways away. It's in chapter 5. I got time. And there's seven false confessions that begin with things like, if we say this, if we say this, then la da 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 I'm not going to tell you that either. Because I want to give you a chance to read this book and see how many of them you can find before I share them with you. There are some beautiful things in this book. And you might find out that your friend that's been asking you, how do you know about this? Or how do you know if this is all right? Or what about this? John, do you think John ever heard any of those in all his years of, uh, uh, of being an apostle and a, and a, and a, 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 and a pastor to the, to the flock? Do you think he ever heard, how do we know that we know these things? Are you sure they're really true? Sure he did. And that's why, I got to tell you, this is one of the, even though it's one of the shortest, to me, short and sweet books, it has some of the best answers to those kind of questions. You, you're going to have friends that ask these. You might even thought these very questions. And this book is like just one after another. Here's the reason. Here's the reason. Here's another reason. Here's another reason. Here's another. And, and by the time, I'll, I'll point them out as we go along. By the time we get done with this book, I want you just to, 
maybe put a little, I put an R. Now, no peeking too close, but there's R's next to the verses where the reasons are. And there's little, there's little pictures I drew of a mouth with a tongue sticking out going, nah, if we say, nah, 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 nah. that's my false confession symbol. I'm an artist, you know, I got a visual learner. Remember, I told you I'm visual, right? Now, I'll, I'll flash it at you, but you can't see which verse yet because I don't want you to get ahead of me. And then I put R's for reasons. The reasons why he wrote. And you know what is interesting? I like that he actually says, this is the reason that I wrote this. If, you know, when, when you hear some preachers, you ever wonder what their reason is that they're preaching? Are they, are they, like, uh, is the guy up there just preaching to get your money? Anyone ever thought that when you went to some fellowship? They're, they're like, this dude is after my money. I can just, you, you're, you're waiting for the pitch. When's the pitch going to come? Where's the barometer on the wall? You know, we don't have one, but, you know, you put a thermometer and we're trying to raise this. Ma- and they, they always, there's a reason. The Bible says that there are false teachers that they, they, they actually preach even for the wrong reasons. I like that John's going to tell us the reasons why he wrote this letter. And once you read all, se- I'll point them out, but at the end, once you read all seven, eight of the reasons, you will find out this letter has some brilliant answers to your friends' questions that they've been, bra- I mean, some of you have been berated by some of your friends about your Christianity. And you didn't know how to answer them because you didn't maybe have the, you know, the knowledge. John has had a lot of experience. Let me read you the next verse, verse 5 of 1 John. He says, this is the message that we have heard from him. Who? Jesus. And we announce to you. Now, anybody here would have liked to sit and listen to Jesus? And then when the, someone says, so what do he say? John says, this is what he, we heard from him. And we get to announce to you. What is his first announcement? God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. There is no darkness in God. Now, you need to know this because this announcement that that John's making is being, I mean, how many times does the devil try to make us question? So is God really good? Is he really light? I mean, maybe there's a few shadows. Maybe he's, you know, mostly good. uh, And by the way, the devil has used Hollywood to really reinforce this kind of blending of light and dark. You get the good guy in the movie. When I was a kid, good guys were good in the movies. Bad guys were bad. They did not make the good guy good but partly bad. And the bad guy bad but but partly good because he's a family man, you know? And, and, and you almost want to root for the bad guy because he seems to have more morals than the good guy, right? Th- has anyone watched any shows recently where they blend the morality of the, char- of the characters? What's that? Lucifer. He says there's a new one on TV, Lucifer. They're making him out like he's kind of mostly good but partly bad or... Mostly bad, but partly good. Yeah, I, it's interesting how we don't want to just say that God is an absolute. But John has an announcement to make, and I get to be the guy who heralds his announcement. God is light. In him, how much darkness is there? None. Someone sent me a little post on Facebook. It was a picture of someone holding a match with the light. It was lit. And they had a bright light, you know, like here's a wall behind the match. You can look at this on our Amazing Grace uh, Facebook page. I just, I reposted it today at about one in the morning. I was up. So I thought, I got to do this because I'm going to be preaching about this. It's an interesting picture. It was a photograph taken with bright lights this way so that the match stick, there's a wall behind here and you can actually see the the outline of the shadow of the matchstick on the wall. But then the person's hand's holding it, right? And the matchstick and the, and the hand has the, the perfect little shadowy outline. But do you know the flame portion 
of the of the match. It's lit. Do you know how much shadow there is on the wall behind? Of the like this, you know how the shape of the flame, right? That little, I don't know. Do it like this, okay? It, l- it looks kind of shaped like that, right? How much of that shape is shown in a shadow on the wall with the matchstick? None. Because that shape that you're looking at is light. And when you try to put light on that to, to make a shadow, how do you get a shadow from something that is light? There, there is no, there's no darkness in light. So any light shined on light will just, it doesn't produce a shadow. There's no shadow. And the interesting thing was someone sent me this as a post and said, I never thought of this before. In light, there's no shadow. I was like, I did. It's a verse in the Bible. <laughs> you know, in, 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 in God's light, there is no shadow. That's a very, it's, it's a quote. And I'm like, yeah, but that picture, I'm visual. Remember, visual learner here. I loved it. I'm holding a match, light shining. You can see the perfect little silhouette of the hand and the little stick and, and no silhouette of the light. Because in light, there is no darkness. And you guys, what do you realize? About? Jesus has come to bring us into the light, into the light of God, into that light where God says, I am here for you. And the Bible gives us so many comforting things. This light is, it's beyond just physical light. But let me assure you, anything that's true in the spiritual realm, it has a shadow in the earthly application. If it's true upstairs in God's throne room, it has a a shadow of that truth down here. The reason I say that is because before I became a Christian, I hung out with Satanists. And you know what one of the prerequisites for their demons coming into them was? We had, to, we had to wait till night. And we couldn't turn on any lights. Demons don't like light at all. They don't even like a, a candle or a little, you know, my little oil lamp, you know, with the little dial that you light lit, the wick, and nope, put it off. I had a little intenser lamp. It was uh, on a little swivel for studying, real bright. And when my possessed friends would come over, they'd be like, put that, d- turn it off. I'm like, no, I need some light. They're like, and they would walk over and push it down onto the desk so that the, the little cup of where the little light shines is, is down flat on the desk like that. There would only be a little rim of light. That was all the light they wanted on in the room. And I was like, there is something weird about these guys. They don't like light at all. They knew. They knew that God is light. And it made them really uncomfortable. Just having physical light made the demons not like. And, you know, it's interesting to me that a lot of people will call me as a pastor and say, Pastor, could you come up to our coffee farm and pray for a blessing? Because at night we have these weird dark shadows and dark walkers and, and, and there's creepy stuff that goes on in the dark. Uh, do you think that's real? And then they'll say something to me that I find really remarkable. They'll be like, you know, I couldn't sleep. I turned on all the lights in the whole house. And and it was like the thing was outside but wouldn't come in once the lights were on. So I just slept with the lights on all night long. So what do you think? I said, amen. Demons hate light. But you know what they hate more than just physical light? The light we're talking about. The light of God. When when you say, Jesus, come into my heart. I need you in here. Jesus says, he stands at the door and he what? Knocks. If anyone opens the door, he comes in and he sups with you. Now, when you have the light of the world come into you spiritually, now the light's on. I mean, your spirit's... Some people are like, Phaedra, you're kind of glowy lately, you know? What's that, what's that light? You, you know, where, where'd you get that? I heard some people say that about her. That's a, by the way, that's a great compliment. That means the Lord is residing in you. And when he's in us, his light, Jesus said, let, let your light so shine 
in the world. Don't hide it un- you don't hide it under a bushel, right? You don't put it under a peck measure. You don't stuff it under the bed. What, what do we do with a lantern? You put it up on a lampstand so it can give light to all that, that need to see. We're supposed to let our good works shine the light of the Lord through our lives so people say, wow, there is a living God. Do you think that I'd get up at 4.35 in the morning every Sunday, stumble around and start packing up stuff to bring food, to give out, and, and you know, look through stuff and see what else we could throw in to bless those that are less fortunate? Would I do that if there was not truly a light of this world? I'm going to tell you from my own selfishness. No way, Jose. Would not happen, I don't care. Me and my pillow are friends. And breaking up that friendship at that ungodly hour is not my idea of a good time. But just like Paul the Apostle said, it is the love of Christ which constraineth me. In other words, it's the love of God that makes me motivated, that drives me, that compels me to live what I live. And because of me knowing how much he loves me and me learning about this light that John is talking about, that that light came into me. And by the way, my demon-possessed friends, when that light came in me, the first thing their reaction was, oh, no, oh, no. Is not to tell them, tell the light to go away. They told me to say that. We have a friend I use that word loosely, a demon that will live in you and give you power. I said, forget it. I already trumped you. I went with the Holy Spirit of God. How much power does he have compared to a demon? He has all the power, right? I'm like, I ain't, that's a, you guys are low life compromising. I'm not going with that. I'm going with God because in him is the true light. No shadow, no shifting of shadows. This is the message John wanted us to know. And it isn't like Hollywood is teaching us. God is mostly good, but he's got a little bad. And Lucifer is mostly bad, but he's got a little good. Listen, don't get your theology from Hollywood. You want to find it in the right place? Look in this book. This is the book that will teach you the testimony of eyewitnesses that were there, that saw Jesus And said, let me tell you, in him, there's no darkness at all. Now, next week, we're going to come to the first confession. I'm giving away one of them. The next verse, verse 6, is going to begin with, if we say, if we say we have fellowship with him, then I'm not going to tell you the rest. You've got to read ahead. Peak your curiosity. Read, if you would, verses 6. It's only, we, we've only got them um, to verse 10, verses 6 to 10, and yet there'll be three false confessions in those four verses. You see them already, don't you? Good. And then we get to chapter 2 next week, and we'll see another reason that he writes, and furthermore reasons, and furthermore false confessions. And if you don't mind, you don't have to draw like little mouse with tongues sticking out for false confession. You can make a star or whatever little notation you want but if you do me a favor and just now i know some people are very um superstitious they're like i can't mark up a bible that would be bad listen if it'll help you learn it is not bad this book right here will this live forever this book no this will this will perish okay this is paper it's got some fancy you know hide on the outside but it's gonna it'll perish someday i know because my old bible finally bit the dust It's not going to last forever. But what this book testifies of, Jesus, the word concerning life, that eternal life that came, that light that came into this world, that is what's going to last forever. And that's what I want you to get to know. And this book, by the time you learn those, those eight ways that we know what we know, that we know, you're going to be so blessed because you're going to finally have some answers when your friends try to zing you. How do you know that you know God is real? How do you know that those things that you're following are really true? How do you? Is that a legit question? 
Sure it is. And Christians shouldn't turn off their brain and think there's no answer. Oh, I don't know. It's a kind of a feeling, man. I'm going to give you an answer to give them with reason that has solid brain power included. And you'll be able to stand and say, this is how I know. Not wonder. What? You think the whole coming of Jesus to this earth is fake? A fable? How many of you heard that? Jesus is just a fable. Well, I got news for you. It doesn't say A.D. and, I don't know, Jack... But Jack and the Beanstalk, B.J. B.J. and A.D., right? No, it says B.C., before Christ. It's not a fable we're talking about. We're talking about a real event, a real event that changed the way they keep the calendars all around the globe. N newsflash, Jesus really came. And newsflash, he said they will try to change the way time is kept. Why? In the last days, here's a sign for you. They will try to change it because they want to remove the fact that who came? Jesus. They don't want you to know that. But I do. No matter what the, no matter what the Jews are trying to write on their calendars today, I find it so funny to see A-C-E, B-C-E. And it marks the exact same. Well, I go, is this a change? In the, nope, it's the same A-D-B-C. Like, like, no big deal. It is a big deal. You're trying to remove the testimony that the Christ actually came. And that testimony is really powerful because that testimony, when he came the first time, he said, I'll be back. Forget Schwarzenegger. Jesus is coming back. You all think he, he, he coined that term. No, Jesus did. So I'll be back. And the second coming won't be in reference to sin. He came the first time like a lamb that was slain. That's why all those prophecies said that Jehovah Jireh in the mount of the Lord it shall be God will provide himself a lamb. That's why it's big deal John the Baptist. Behold the lamb of what? Of God that takes away sins of the world. That's a guy. Big deal news flash. But the second coming Jesus said won't be in reference to sin. He did that one time. He's only came to die once. Next time he'll come in power. On a flying horse for all of you that like animals. I got quite a few here. Let me tell you, in heaven, we got upgrades, <laughs> flying horses. I mean, this is my daughter's joy. She's like, Daddy, will there be animals in heaven? Yes, honey. Read Revelation. The animals are way better. I mean, they're decked out. They got like a face of a lion on one side, a face of a bear, and a face of an eagle, and all on one creature. And they cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I mean, it's pretty cool. We got upgrades to look for horses that fly. As soon as I told my daughter that, she's like, I'm in. She loves horses. Joy loves horses. But flying horses? Daddy, let's go. When she was little, Daddy, let's go to heaven, man. I want to ride a flying horse. Honey, don't be in a hurry. We, we'll get to that. We, we, but you do know we all get one, right? Anyone here want one besides me? Think this is going to be fun? You know, did anyone watch Avatar, where the guy took his braid and stuck it on that thing and, <laughs> and started flying and hanging? Did anyone think that looked like fun besides me, a thrill seeker? I thought, oh, yes. But who's to say my horse can't do that? I mean, I'm getting a flying horse from the Lord. I don't know its name, but I'll probably name it whatever, you know, Betsy. Let's go, Betsy. Pew. Fly. It'll be fun. That's Daniel's car's name. Whatever. I never name my cars, but my wife does. My Subaru was red, so she called it Bob the Tomato. This will tell you the era of our cars. I, you have to know Veggie Tales to know the reference to Bob the Tomato. And then we had the the the, the Land Rover, the green thing. That's Larry the Cucumber. And <laughs> Only you people who have little ones know what I'm talking about. And this, uh, but oh, you know this? <laughs> she knows it. <laughs> well, we're going to name our horses, I think. Or else maybe they'll come named. But I don't know about you, but I'm going for a ride. And it says that all of the believers that have died before us 
Don't be crying about them like Dawn. My heart was heavy because I missed Dawn, my assistant pastor. He's been gone now like five years. I was thinking, man, I miss him. He's in heaven in no pain, no sorrow. He's already got his flying horse. We're going to get there and be like, watch this trick. You know? And I, I know him. He's so into cooking. He'll be like, Iz, come over here. I got a golden Kamado. You know, that's the Japanese clay oven thing we, he taught me to cook on. It looks like a big oversized uh, Weber barbecue. He's going to probably have one solid gold, you know, for all of his, all of his treasures, what he laid up in heaven from feeding the poor and helping the less fortunate, you know, going on missions trips to the Philippines and helping the, the kids over there. I look and I think, Lord, you know, we have a lot to look forward to because of you. This word concerning life, this life he's talking about, how long is it? <laughs> Eternal. How many of you have put your faith in Jesus? Raise your hand. You know that you have everlasting life, right? No matter what happens to you down here, if you die, no big deal. Because the Bible says you don't actually die, you just move. If you ever read in the, in the paper, Pastor Izzy died. Call up the paper and say, bad reporting. He didn't die. He moved. He moved from this earthly realm to the heavenly one. The true, because I won't be dead. I'll just have left this earthly tent, what Paul calls this body, an earthly tent. I'll have left this thing behind. And I'll be taking up residence in a mansion, not made by human hands, made by God. Eternal in the heavens. Now, is that good news? For you guys that, <laughs> well, our brother Steve... Hudson is, is trying to get, I, I tell him, he's taking cuts. He's trying to get in line before me and get to heaven. But, but I know he just wants to get back here to say goodbye to us before he gets to go get his heavenly mansion. And, and no, but the doctors this week told him, no good news. We've done everything we can, sorry. So I, to uh, I got word on Tuesday that his heart is just... If he can get enough strength, he wants to come back here before he dies. He didn't mind me telling you. So I'm just telling you, pray for our brother Steve. I'd like to s maybe see him next week. That he could come, even though he would, he used to tell me, Pastor, you just lay it out. Just leave it out there on the, uh, uh, on the beach. Just preach your heart out. Don't worry about saving anything in the tank. I'll put away all the chairs. I'll put away all. He goes, I can't preach, but I can put away stuff. And his whole heart was like, you don't have to worry about it. you. You preach and you pray with people. That's your gift. I'll, I'll put away stuff. And I feel so blessed to have a man like that in my life because he was like a strong support. He'd come in. they drive all the way from White Kaloa. they get down here. And I, as soon as I see him pulling up, I'd be like, okay, Lord, this is going to be a good one. I don't have to save nothing. I'm going for it. I can preach my heart out and just leave it all out there on the sand. I'm done. And he'd go, I got you. And I got to pray for like 10 guys to replace him. Because he knew where everything went. He'd get up there on the trailer and just be like, now Holland is starting to help fill in the hole, you know. But we could use like five Hollands to make it, you know. This guy, he just had a gift. He still has it, by the way. But he's going to be in heaven praising the Lord. And he would tell you, don't mourn for him going. I'll mourn for his family. For his wife, Cookie. For his sons. Wonderful young men. They're, they're the ones my heart will mourn for. And mourn with. When Steve goes. But for Steve, I won't mourn. Because he's going to get his flying horse before me. That rat. And by the way, I'm hoping that he'll get to see this on the video. Before he goes. Because he'll know I was talking about it. And that we're going to end now with praying for him. Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, I thank you for giving me such a loving brother named Steve Hudson. And his wife, Cookie. And I, I pray for his son, Hunter, and for all of the, the whole family, Lord, that's going to be affected by his departure. You would give great grace to their family. I pray, even as has been prayed many a time for believers, that you would make his going to you easy. That he would be able to just close his eyes here and open them with that curtain peeled back. And there is the revelation of you. And your son sitting there waiting for him, just arms outstretched to receive him. Lord, I pray his receiving to you would be something not painful to him, not to his family, 
but in easygoing. And Lord, if it's all right, I ask that you let him stay maybe long enough to come visit us a few more times. That's my own selfish prayer, Lord. But I ask you that in Jesus' name with all my brothers and sisters. And all those of, those of you that agreed said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me listening to a closing song? And Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.